Good evening. I'm Alan Block, your host on Oral Traditions. This evening I have with me Howard Morris, one of the real greats of television, uh, whose career goes back uh, with Maurice Evans in 1945 Hamlet to a very distinguished career on uh, the show of shows with Sid Caesar and Imogene Coco. Later on this evening, he's going to regale us with one of the a great, great Sholem Aleichem stories from Helm, Land of Helm, the birth of the bagel. Right now, though, Howard, uh, tell Hello. us. Hello. Very good. <laughs> uh, you were telling me earlier uh, the story of your mother at the organ before the silver screen. And yeah. you were looking up at the, the screen and you saw who was it that was playing then? Well, should I set the whole scene? I was, yeah. I was about five, and what we were talking about were the initiating uh, insinuations to enter the theater and uh, as a profession. I was five, and uh, I really remember sitting in the front row of a little silent movie theater on 181st Street near Broadway in Manhattan in New York, a long time ago, looking straight up at a silent movie screen and watching a movie that was projected there and it was starring a German actor named Emil Jennings in a movie called The Last Command and there was music playing and it was an organ and down there to my left was a dark-haired woman sitting playing the organ rehearsing this was before the audience came in and it was my mother and that was my kind of initiation into the theater of any kind you got nailed at five huh? nailed at For five a bit totally nailed at five and <laughs> the nailing has continued uh, then you you did uh, theater in high school wasn't it mm-hmm uh, that sort of continued the yeah it uh, kept the bug going bug going and uh, I learned a lot I was an only child I, I call myself an only lonely and uh, a, a kid like that kind of has to engender things for him to fill his life with. You don't have brothers and sisters to hock with, and you make up things and you play scenes with yourself. Like, you did a lot uh, of fantasizing? Oh, yeah. yeah. I still do. Uh, <laughs> I fantasize I'm going to get old and be a star. <laughs> <laughs> someday. <laughs> someday. Someday. Uh, <clears throat> in your, in your uh, experience base, uh, you went to college, NYU. Yeah, I got a scholarship so, to NYU. And you studied theater. Mm -hmm. uh, drama. Drama. And then uh, you learn from the street, as you said, your gigs on the... Yeah. Uh, what, what balance? I mean, was the professional discipline uh, that you, or inspiration you got in college, how did that weigh versus just, say, rounding yourself out in uh, getting employment and learning from your peers? Well, it's all a learning process which really never ceases. I'm learning right now how to relate to you and cameras, and we're in a studio, yeah. but we're trying to make believe it's okay, right? <laughs> um, I, in college, the, the main thing that I discovered in college was to work, to do scenes, to do plays, to relate to other actors. There were obvious things like uh, makeup and uh, wardrobe and lighting and dance and mm -hmm. speech and diction and swordplay and all those things, which are kind of basic uh, requirements. But what you really learn is to look. James Cagney said it best. He said, how do you act, Mr. Cagney? He says, how do I act? He says, well, I hear my cue. I walk in. I plant my feet. I look the guy in the eye, and I tell the truth. I swear to you, that's really what it's about, relating to other people and being able to listen and, and understand. I wonder what he meant. <laughs> uh, you had a big break, uh, the, the show of shows, mm -hmm. which was, as you said, uh, uh, three seasons a year, 39. Uh, 39 uh, live uh, shows every year, uh, an hour and a half each. Now, if you do eight shows in uh, 12 months, that's a lot. That's a lot. And you hope. And you hope, yeah. Right. Well, we hope then, too. But just the, the experience of doing that, how, putting how, them together. How did, how did you go from? Uh, wherever you were doing to this chance to work with probably legendary now actors and writers. How did I do it? Yes. Luck. Luck. <laughs> How were you ready for the luck? That you knew it was luck? And, and uh, just a whole background and a sense of grabbing on to something that one sensed was exciting. 
and was creative. And being allowed to do that. Uh, Lee Cobb, a very <clears throat> well-known actor who's no longer with us, said that after he played in Death of a Salesman, he said that was like walking on the mountaintops. He said since then, it's been trudging through the valleys and the mists. And the experiences I had on Show of Shows are difficult to repeat and find again. I have had such experiences since, not many. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that was really a highlight for all of us there, I know. It launched, how many careers would you say it launched? Three. Three, yours? Uh, hundreds, hundreds, really hundreds. Uh -huh. uh, mine, Sid Caesar, of course, Imogene Coca, Carl Reiner, Mel Brooks, Larry Gelbart, Doc Simon, Neil Simon's brother Danny, Joe Stein, Aaron Rubin, Woody Allen, a whole list of people, in, many of whom I've left out, and uh -huh. forgive me for that, but... It's extraordinary. Uh, it was indigenous to its times. So there it was a challenge. Mm. The, the audience... You, you have to remember, this show started in 1948, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56. It was about 10 years, 57. Mm. And it was a review. It was in the review form, which the audience was not very familiar with. I'm talking about the audience. I'm talking about the national audience. People in New York were used to satire and reviews, but rare, if ever, had the middle sections of the country, or even the West Coast, I guess, seen a lot of that. And uh, it was a whole ripe audience that we were able to attack and bring to its knees. And they were fascinated with these thinking things. It wasn't just Busby Berkeley's song and dance. It had meaning, it had depth, it had comment, it had a sense of revelation from man unto himself. Oh my God, listen to this big mouth. <laughs> there were things of import there. We were satirizing movies and we were talking about the innards of people. It's like a, uh, almost an ensemble, a repertory ensemble. Well, it, you came it did back become that, yeah. And you played off one another. Interrelating and, a lot, yeah. yes. You yeah, asked me uh, before we started taping, uh, was there much, or somebody asked me if there's much ad-libbing and improvising. Mm -hmm. Not in performance, but in putting it together mm -hmm. the week prior mm -hmm. to the show. We would sit around and wing it and throw things back and forth. There were like 15 crazy Jews in a room screaming and yelling. Do you think that the, the objective conditions can ever present themselves where you could get that kind of group of... Uh, that chemistry? Uh, again, talent, writers. I, have, I, haven't, I haven't found it That's quite right. yet, uh -huh. no. Uh -huh. That was special. Mm -hmm. It was special. The uh, uh, speaking... That, you, excuse me. Uh, I know it's special because uh, once in a while I will see <clears throat> not a, till, a, a, a tape or film because there was none. It was live. Mm -hmm. Live. And now I say it was live to young people and they say, why, why is that? They don't understand what that is. That means that as we do it now, they're watching it. And the concept of that is something difficult for them to grasp because they go to the movies and they sit at home and they know it's all filmed or taped mm -hmm. and it's been done before. And if a mistake is made, you stop and fix it. We weren't allowed to make mistakes. We had to do it. What was the question? So on live. <laughs> the, uh, the, um, I'm, I'm interested in the, the relationship of, uh, of how we live now and our tradition and how meaningful the tradition is. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, and, and what of the tradition we can hold on to, what can we bring to it that enriches it in, in, in the general in the community? And I'm especially interested in the artists. Tradition, tradition. of what? Uh, well, I guess say in... I've become the interviewer. Uh, right, right. <laughs> I, I, I'd say in this, uh, in our story of Hefam Helm from Shalom Aleichem, yeah. there was a, a recreation of a tradition, a way people lived. And yes. probably the humor told about their longings, their needs, the way they survived. And um, there was something like... Uh, it was something homogeneous of the New York Jews, uh, many of them. I would say homogeneous, but okay. Homogenous. They, uh, yeah, I, as long I, as they I got think I, I think I know what you're talking about, sort of. To comment on it, I don't know quite what to say. I don't think audiences have changed that much. They're still the same human the beings with the, the same needs. The performers and the writers still pretty much the same. You want to talk about management that allows performance and allows writers, 
That's different. I'll tell you, may I tell you a brief story? Please. I, I get interviewed occasionally for jobs, and I was called about a job in a movie. And I went to this executive producer. I walked into the room. I was going to act, and he uh -huh. wanted to see me about an acting job. I walked into the room, and I swear the guy was 12 years old. He maybe was 28. Uh -huh. Very young, OK? Closer to the audience is supposed to be serving. Supposed to be, uh -huh. yeah. Uh -huh. uh, and, and, and he said to me, he said, uh, Mr. Morris, yes? He said, I see you, uh, you worked on the show of shows. I said, that's correct. Uh -huh. He said, tell me, is Sid Caesar still singing? Uh -huh. I took this pause, and I was thinking, you dumb schmuck, why don't you leave the room, leave the building, leave the business, leave the earth? <laughs> but I have a job you bit your pending. <laughs> you bit your time. I have a job pending, and, and I job. said, here's what I said. Uh-huh. Yeah, still singing. Uh -huh. What's the difference? He don't know. Well, you said something. Sid's a hell of a singer. Yeah, uh, yes. Yeah. You said something about uh, the, um, the fruitiness, the texture of the story you're going to tell. That, and you love to play it off. And it seems to me that that's neat when there's a, a classical literature that's great. And you can just play off wild. Like, but the stuff you read is thin then, you know, it's not inspiration. We, we are at the mercy of the script and the uh, concept uh, and what the guys upstairs will allow uh -huh. because of their, uh, oh, they have these, they do tests and they, they know yeah. about audiences. Uh -huh. And they take off the good shows and they leave the lousy ones. It's a funny, <laughs> funny thing, funny about that. Uh -huh. Funny about that. Uh, again. I mean, soap is not. Soap was charming and wonderful and revealed some qualities of man to us. And it's mm -hmm. gone. Why is it gone? Uh, what was wrong with that? Uh, you're asking the wrong man. It may be through as you get to the right guy. Uh, oh, I, I, I don't know. I've, you know, I don't really care if I do. I just uh -huh. feel that once in a while I have to open my mouth and get in trouble again. Uh, no, I, I think that uh, there are many, many talented people that don't have a chance to exercise their talent, I guess, because the well, new fashion. The road is paved with the corpses of very talented people who mm -hmm. just couldn't mm -hmm. stick it out any longer. Well, I... Um, I've been lucky. You've been lucky. Got a question? What, what, what <laughs> yeah, what, what has sustained... Are you at ease? Are you, are you feeling yeah, at ease? Yeah, better. You're doing a very good job for me. <laughs> so are you. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, what has sustained you? I, I have some experience with uh, professional actors and actresses and uh, something else that I do, and I absolutely marvel at these people who can't even exercise their trade. I mean, that's all they really want to do. And yet, when they get up in between, I mean, I mean, when they're asked to perform, they perform like the Lakers in championship level yeah. without the whole season. Yeah. What is it about actors and actresses that, you know, fear. that fear? Fear. As my friend Mel Brooks says, fear is the greatest propellant in the world. <laughs> fear of what? Failing? Succeeding? Fear of not satisfying your sense of responsibility to yourself and to the art which you mm. have chosen to contribute to contribute to, mm -hmm. ending with a preposition, to which you have chosen mm -hmm. to contribute. Better? Mm -hmm. um, the readiness is all. That's a quote from Shakespeare. From it, Hamlet, uh, as a matter of fact. Right. Classy, eh? <laughs> the readiness is all. There is a special providence in the fall of a sparrow. I could go on like this. Sleep that knits up the rebel <laughs> sleeve of care. You, you like this, guys? Huh? You like what I'm doing? Nod, nod your camera if you like it. <laughs> what? Oh, somebody uh, said yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, no, really, let me try to answer that. What is it that makes these poor people who are totally rejected most of the time? What? The need. There's a great need to be, to be sharing in this particular mm -hmm. creative medium. Uh, how do they sustain themselves? I mean, if you don't exercise your you mean, what do you do? No, I don't mean financially. I mean emotionally. How do you? Why get don't you mean financially? That's the well, hardest part yes, of it. Yeah, okay, go ahead. True. Emotionally. No. It's rough, pal. Yeah. You must be the kind of human being that chooses this to be part of because it is filled with pain, mm -hmm. sadism, and rejection. Mm -hmm. But I got to tell you, when it works, it's fine. Mm -hmm. About two years ago, I had the pleasure of appearing in uh, St. Petersburg, Florida at a dinner theater in a play called Tribute, which mm -hmm. Jack Lemmon did mm -hmm. in New York mm -hmm. and then made mm -hmm. a film of it. Mm -hmm. And I got to play that wonderful part. 
and my feet were on that stage, and I could feel my feet gripping the stage, and I got to communicate with a wonderful audience who were enjoying themselves as much as I was. Mm -hmm. And what I gave them, they gave back to me. And I got to tell you, that is one hell of a feeling. I'm exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's why you we're gotta ready. you got to save a little bit for the bagels. Oh, there will always be something for the bagels. <laughs> uh, we got to kind of wrap this up, I understand. Do we? And we just began. We'll yeah. try something yeah. else. Yeah. We'll have to do some more Helm stories, so I have a chance okay. to uh, interview okay. again. Okay, you want to shake hands? Uh, it's uh, terrific. It's been marvelous. Nice to meet you. You Mark did pleasure. good. Thank you very much. <laughs> good evening. And we are now going to see a rendition of The Birth of the Bagel. It's a story. Uh, from Shalom Aleichem series, from the land of Helm, and I've happened to have seen it already, and it's terrific. You're in for a real view. How'd you pleasure. see it already? It was a magic of television. <laughs> right. How did you see it already? Good evening. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to get too academic, but I'd like to explore with you uh, Jewish humor, maybe the essence of Jewish humor. Now, I know this is very uh, brazen of me, but I'm going to tell a, a joke. I won't really Are you? push it. Uh, well, I'll get you in the day uh, or in the uh, night. Go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> it's a story of um, a very, very devout uh, Orthodox religious community in Poland. And the rabbi was a, a very, very uh, uh, Hasidic and intensely religious, existentially religious. And, and one night he was overcome by the sense of his smallness before God and he threw himself on the beam and started pounding. I'm nothing, I'm worthless. Before you, God, I, I'm a nobody. And the chazan, the cantor next to him, he, got, he felt the spirit too and he was moved to say, oh Lord, you know, uh, I'm so inconsequential. I too am a nobody. And uh, the janitor, the, <laughs> The shamus in the back was cleaning up. Says, I'm a nobody, I'm a nobody. So the rabbi looks to the chazan and says, so look who's a nobody. <laughs> uh, what's Jewish that's about a, that's that? That's a very subtle joke. What's, this, what's Jewish about that? I can only compare it by telling you another one. The, uh, the young man comes to the, to the big rabbi and he says, Rev, he says, tell me, why is the sea so salty? And the Reb thinks a minute and he says, because of the herrings that live there. They've kind of, it's a mm -hmm. certain convoluted wisdom going around back and discovering. It's like the two, not, the two Jews who were stood up against the wall and they're going to be shot by the Nazis. And one of them starts to scream and yell, he don't want to die. The other one says, shh. Don't make trouble. If they're going to get it. You know, I, 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 I re can you explain that? I can't. It's, That's the absurd in a way. It is it's the absurd. absurd. And it, it, there is a Talmudic looking at one's condition from the side, almost with a mm. detached view. Mm -hmm. It's just wonderful. I, I can't answer your question. I don't know how to answer it. I'm, I'm wondering that um, I've watched you here and then on the... You're so quick. This uh, instantaneous reaction you have to do it, take, you do it four different ways. And uh, is that the essence of uh, humor? The, no, the that's the way? essence of, not, of no <laughs> discipline, <laughs> not knowing what to uh, do. So you try 20 ways, one might work. <clears throat> uh, that's a fountain of energy. I, I, but, I uh, do find if I, <clears throat> if I have to do a thing over and over and over, I have to refresh it with mm -hmm. newness each mm -hmm. time. Not repeat what I did, but mm -hmm. find a new way to approach it to keep it spontaneous. Is, is this, like you were, just, you were just saying that the, the Jew sort of gets out of his head and he looks at it a different way. You just described you're getting, I mean, if you can do the same thing 20 different ways, you're, you have this ability to pull away and... That's kind of a habit function, really, a habit. over the years of just improvising thoughts oh. and feelings and ideas and, and working with other people who come in with a different trail. They come together and you've got uh -huh. this to look at. You've come from this way, you've got this to look at. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm looking this way, I'm seeing that. You're looking that way, you're seeing... Uh -huh. We're in the same room, uh -huh. same experience, same sounds, but we're feeling and seeing different things. Mm -hmm. Boy, is this 
important discussion. What uh -huh. was saying? And then, psh, and then right. pull the, the plug. Yeah. The <laughs> you uh. want to know about Jewish humor? <clears throat> I don't know. I remember <clears throat> Leo Fuchs, wonderful actor in the Yiddish Art Theater. He was doing a play on Broadway. And, and the, the, I don't know what the, they were in barber chairs, joint barber chairs. And his friend was talking about a friend of theirs. He says, oh, he has done so well. He's done wonderful. I mean, he's on top of the world. He's a millionaire. So Fuchs says, he's a millionaire or a millionaire or a millionaire. The sound made it uh -huh. different. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. It's a millionaire, not a millionaire. A millionaire. The qualified millionaire uh -huh. just with the inflection. Mm. That staggering talent. But where? has to do with an attitude, I th uh. it, which isn't basically racial, it's just compensative of what has happened to the Jews mm -hmm. over the years. Mm -hmm. They have to make jokes. You don't want to cry all the time, do you? So you make a joke where there's pain, and God knows there's been pain. Uh, is, is that that unique experience, that if there's pain and it's been handed on and there's a ways of handling it, and you use your wit and... You use your humor. Yeah, your don't humanity. make trouble. Is that been sort of dissipated, torn away? I mean, what have we... Well, there's less overt pain. <clears throat> We're not beaten up by the Cossacks anymore. We're right. beaten up now by uh, sophisticated Nazis mm -hmm. and people like that. But the young, the young humorists that are Jewish, I mean, they tell stories that are American stories. That, I mean, that... We're assimilating uh, again. It's, it's okay. What is our special contribution to this broad mixture that makes America? Is it any special anymore? Are we homogenized? Uh, I think it's joy and sadness mixed. Joy and sadness. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, when I did tribute, the feelings I had on the stage, because it's about a man who is dying of cancer, but the laughter is incredible because he makes jokes about it. Mm -hmm. Well, Norman Cousins said he cured himself of mm -hmm. cancer mm -hmm. with humor. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's possible, but it sure makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I've given my children, <clears throat> I have four kids from one marriage or another, and I think the only decent thing I've given them is laughter. Mm. I've insisted upon it. God damn it, you laugh. laugh at me. And they, they do. And uh, I, at themselves I, or the world? At themselves, at the uh, world, at everything if possible. Uh, I don't mean to go around going, yulla, uh, yulla. Uh, I don't mean uh, that. Uh, but to see our own frailties and to be mm. amused by it and not beat the breast so much. Well, that's, you uh, got me to lecture yeah, yeah, on humor. Good. <laughs> uh, is, it, is, it, is it the is it a, is there other humane humors that really poke fun at yourself, and other humors that of really course. that go after other people? Well, those are hostile down. humors. Uh -huh. uh, tear them down. I, I am of the theory that most jokes are hostility veiled mm -hmm. in humor and laughter. It's the underdog trying to get. Uh, yeah, trying to, you know, get even. And when we do take off at other races, we're doing that so that we can feel at least that there's somebody lesser than we are. But uh, was the Jew putting himself down to feel superior in those jokes? No, I, th I think he knows he's the smartest man. He's the smartest. Man. Oh, yeah, and that's true. Uh, we are the chosen people. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Well, I, I enjoyed this. I did, too. Okay. I don't know whether we're through or not, but Is I'm through. Is that enough for you, <laughs> they're Elio? Winding, they're yeah. winding us. <laughs> yes. Um, Once again, it's been nice talking uh, with you. It's, it's a really a pleasure, and I hope that you can come again and do more of the exciting material you've worked My on. mother taught me it's to polite to wait until you're asked. That's you're asked <laughs> okay. on television. I'll be happy to come. Pleasure. Good evening. Thank you. Likewise, I'm sure. You want to beg? Three wise men of Helm decided to go on a fact-finding mission to Vilna to broaden their horizons and the horizons of the other wise people of Helm. Shloimi the scientist was fascinated with what he saw in the Vilna bakery. I discovered something worth taking home. Look, I brought you some. Shloimi opened a large bag and took out a bunch of baked rings. What are those? asked the others. They're called bagels. Bagels, hey, that's a new one, said Abba, the mayor's grandson. New or old, answered Shlemy. What difference does it make? Look at them. Did you ever see baked goods like this? It's shaped like a millstone with a hole in the middle and a ring of dough around the hole. But never mind the shape. Taste it. I have never eaten anything so delicious as this. They sampled the bagels. 
Mm -hmm. They smacked their lips and admitted that Shlomi was right. They made an entire meal of bagels with milk, devouring a half dozen bagels and three glasses of milk apiece. Next day, all three of them hurried to the bakery. They each ate a dozen bagels fresh from the oven and found them still better, warm and crisp. When they could eat no more, they said to the baker, Please, baker, teach us how to make bagels. We'll pay you handsomely for your trouble. The baker agreed. He showed the wise men of Helm how to knead the dough, how to cook the bagels in a big iron kettle filled with boiling water. Then he taught them how to put the boiled bagels on the baker's peel and bake them on the floor of a hot brick oven. They watched carefully, and then Reuben the roofer turned to Shlomi. I didn't grasp everything. Do you understand how to bake them? I believe so, but I would like the baker to do it over again from the beginning. Especially, I would like to know how he gets the hole in the middle. The baker looked at them and then asked quietly, Are you from Helm, my brother Jews? They nodded. If that's the case, there is no point going over the whole thing again. You surely grasped it all. As for the round hole in December, <laughs> that's very simple. You take a ready-made hole, you surround it with dough, join the ends, you got a bagel ready to bake. Shloimi was a bit ruffled. Red Baker, I understood that the first time. My question is, where do you get the round holes? Oh, that, my dear Helmite, sensed the baker. You see, I inherited a supply of round holes from my father. You see, he inherited them from his father. You see, I happen to be descended from generations and generations of bagel bakers as far as, as far back as our father Abraham, who can say? But as for your supply, Wait, let me look you over. You sturdy fellows. <laughs> you can each carry six strings of bagels on your neck. Three dozen a string, 18 dozen a piece, comes to 54 dozen bagels. 54 dozen bagels means 648 holes. So you have a good supply of round holes. All you have to do is be careful to leave the hole intact when you eat the bagel. So it can be used again. Eh? Eh? You sell a bagel, you tell the customer, please don't destroy the hole. In fact, you bring back the hole, should be in good shape. I'll give you a discount. That way, you'll have an endless supply of round holes. Then and there, the three Helmites decided to return home. Each one put six ropes of bagel round his neck, like necklaces. They stuffed as many bagels as they could into their pockets to eat along the road. Happens it's quite a distance from Vilna to Helm. On the sixth day, as they approached Helm, the country becomes very hilly and walking very difficult. Two miles from Helm, they climbed a very steep hill. Below it lay a village. Tired, perspiring, they sat down. After a while, Shlomi spoke. Abba and Reuben, you shouldn't be in such a hurry to carry the bagels on your necks. You remember, we built our synagogue. We couldn't carry the great oak log down the hill. We were told that any round object can be rolled down the hill. You remember? Of course we remember. What we don't remember, of course we remember. Then why carry ropes and bagel around your neck? Aren't bagels round? So we'll take the bagels off the ropes, which anyway are chafing our necks badly, and we will roll the bagels down the hill. That's a wonderful idea, Shlaimi. You got some head on your shoulder. Shlaimi answered, hmm. Then they removed the ropes and bagels from their necks, untied the strings, and rolled the bagels down the hill. But no sooner did the bagels reach the valley than dogs and goats from the village rushed and made short work of them. When the Helmites saw what was happening, they shouted, all right, eat all you want, but be careful with the holes. Watch out for them holes. Dogs are dogs, goats are goats. When are they considerate? By the time the Helmites reached the foot of the hill, there was not a sign of a bagel, not a trace of a hole. Dogs are dogs, goats are goats. Do they have any idea from value, I ask you? <laughs> well, Shloimi the scientist did not give in. With the help of Beryl the Beetle, Shlomi arranged for a delegation of seven of Helm's wisest men to return once more to Vilna. This time, they succeeded in purchasing 1,000 ready-made holes, perfectly round, of course. And this is how the bagel became a staple in the town of Helm. And to this day, this is why in Helm, in Vilna, in London, in Paris, in Baghdad, in Burbank, in all cities, in all countries, the sign of success and of prime quality is ever epitomized by one simple gesture.
Three wise men of Helm decided to go on a fact-finding mission to Vilna to broaden their horizons and the horizons of the other wise people of Helm. Shlomi the scientist was fascinated with what he saw in the Vilna bakery. I discovered something worth taking home. Look, I brought you some. Shlomi opened a large bag and took out a bunch of baked rings. What are those? asked the others. They're called bagels. Bagels? <laughs> That's a new one, said Abba, the mayor's grandson. New or old, answered Shlemy. What difference does it make? Look at them. Did you ever see baked goods like this? It's shaped like a millstone with a hole in the middle and a ring of dough around the hole. But never mind the shape. Taste it. I have never eaten anything so delicious as this. They sampled the bagels. Mm. They smacked their lips and admitted that Shlemy was right. They made an entire meal of bagels with milk, devouring a half dozen bagels and three glasses of milk apiece. Next day, all three of them hurried to the bakery. They each ate a dozen bagels, fresh from the oven, and found them still better, warm and crisp. When they could eat no more, they said to the baker, Please, baker, teach us how to make bagels. We'll pay you handsomely for your trouble. The baker agreed. He showed the wise men of Helm how to knead the dough, how to cook the bagels in a big iron kettle filled with boiling water. Then he taught them how to put the boiled bagels on the baker's peel and bake them on the floor of a hot brick oven. They watched carefully, and then Reuben the roofer turned to Shloimi. I didn't grasp everything. Do you understand how to bake them? I believe so, but I'd like the baker to go over it again from the beginning. Especially, I'd like to know how he gets the hole in the middle. The baker looked at them and then asked quietly, Are you from Helm, my brother Jews? They nodded. If that's the case, there is no point going over the whole thing again. You surely grasped it all. And as for the round hole in the center, that's simple. <laughs> you take a ready-made hole, you surround it with dough, join the ends, you got a bagel ready to bake. <laughs> Shlomi was a bit ruffled. Red Baker, I understood that the first time. My question is, where do you get the round holes? Oh, that, my dear Helmites, answered the baker. You see, I inherited a supply of round holes from my father. You see, he inherited them from his father. You see, I happen to be descended from generations and generations of bagel bakers as far back as... As far back, uh, who can say, as Abraham? But that's for your supply. Um, we went to, uh, you were looking at the wrong camera when you were doing uh, the narrator. Um, you were looking at the other camera, which got us confused. You're not watching me, you're watching the script, is what you're saying. No, I'm, watch, well, I'm watching you, but I got confused because I thought the narration, uh, you were looking at the other camera. I thought I had done it magnificently, but apparently not. Okay, you want to do it again from the top? Is that what you want? Yes. Sir. Okay, let's go. <clears throat> Three wise men of Helm decided to go on a fact-finding mission to Vilna to broaden their horizons and the horizons of the other wise people of Helm. Shloimi the scientist was fascinated with what he saw in the Vilna bakery. I discovered something worth taking home. Look, I brought you some. Shloimi opened a large bag and took out a bunch of baked rings. What are those? asked the others. They're called the bagels. Bagels, eh? That's a new one, said Abba, the mayor's grandson. New or old, answered Shlomi. What difference does it make? Look at them. Did you ever see baked goods like this? It's shaped like a millstone with a hole in the middle, a ring of dough around the hole. But never mind the shape. Taste it. I have never eaten anything so delicious as this. They sampled the bagels. They smacked their lips and admitted that Shlomi was right. They made an entire meal of bagels with milk, devouring a half dozen bagels and three glasses of milk apiece. Next day, all three of them hurried to the bakery. They each ate a dozen bagels, fresh from the oven, and found them still better, warm and crisp. When they could eat no more, they said to the baker, Please, baker, teach us how to make bagels. We'll pay you handsomely for your trouble. The baker agreed. He showed the wise men of Helm how to knead the dough, 
how to cook bagels in a big iron kettle filled with boiling water. Then he taught them how to put the boiled bagels on the baker's peel and bake them on the floor of a hot oven. They watched each other carefully, and then Reuben the roofer turned to Shloimi. I didn't grasp everything. Do you understand how to bake them? I believe so, but I'd like the baker to go over it once again from the beginning. Especially, I would like to know how he gets the hole in the middle. The baker looked at them and then asked quietly, Are you from Helm, my brother Jews? They nodded. If that's the case, there is no point going over the whole thing again. You surely grasped it all. As for the round hole in the center, <laughs> that's simple. <laughs> you take a ready-made hole, you surround it with dough, join the ends, you got a bagel ready to bake. Shloimi was a bit ruffled. Red Baker, I understood that the first time. My question is, where do you get the round holes? Oh, that, my dear Helmites, answered the baker. You see, I inherited a supply of round holes from my father. You see, he inherited them from his father. You see, I happen to be descended from generations and generations of bagel bakers as far back, as far back as our father Abraham, who can say? But. As for your supply, wait, let me look you over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You sturdy fellows. You can each carry six strings of bagels on your neck, three dozen a string, 18 dozen a piece, comes to 54 dozen bagels. 54 dozen bagels means 648 holes. So you got a good supply of round holes. All you have to do is be careful to leave the holes intact when you eat the bagel so it can be used again. Eh? 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 You sell a bagel, you say to the customer, Please don't destroy the hole. In fact, you bring back the hole. Should be in good shape. I'll give you a discount. That way, you'll have an endless supply of round holes. Then and there, the three Helmites decided to return home. Each one put six ropes of bagels around his neck like necklaces. They stuffed as many bagels as they could into their pockets to eat along the road. Happens it's quite a distance from Vilna to Helm. On the sixth day, as they approached Helm, the country becomes very hilly and walking very difficult. Two miles from Helm, they climb a steep hill. Below it lies a village. Tired, perspiring, they sat down. After a while, Shloimi spoke. Abba and Reuben, you shouldn't be in such a hurry to carry the bagels on your neck. You remember, we built our synagogue. We couldn't carry the great oak log down the hill. We were told that any round object can be rolled down the hill. You remember? Of course we remember. What, we don't remember? Of course we remember. Then why carry ropes of bagel around your neck? On bagels round? So we'll take the bagels off the neck, off the ropes, which anyway are shaking our necks badly, and we will roll them down the hill. That's a wonderful idea, Shlemy. You got some head on your shoulder. <laughs> Shlemy answered, hmm. Then they removed the ropes of bagels from their necks, untied the strings, and rolled the bagels down the hill. But no sooner did the bagels reach the valley below than dogs and goats from the village rushed and made short work of them. When the Helmites saw what was happening, they shouted, All right, eat all you want, but be careful with the holes. Watch out for them holes. Dogs are dogs, goats are goats, when are they considerate? By the time the Helmites reached the foot of the hill, there was not a sign of a bagel, not a trace of a hole. Dogs are dogs, goats are goats. <laughs> Do they have any idea of value, I ask you? Well, Shlomi the scientist did not give in. With the help of Beryl the beetle, Shlomi arranged for a delegation of seven of Helm's wisest men to return once more to Vilna. This time, they succeeded in purchasing 1,000 ready-made holes, perfectly round, of course. And this is how the bagel became a staple in the town of Helm. And to this day, this is why in Helm, in Vilna, in London, in Paris, in Baghdad, in Burbank, in all cities, in all countries, the sign of success and of prime quality is ever epitomized by one simple gesture. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>